Space Station K7, this is Captain Kirk of the Enterprise. What is your emergency? Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the best episodes of Star Trek, the original series, that is. We meet at the appointed place. Number 20, The Enemy Within. There are two good reasons to watch season one's The Enemy Within. When Captain Kirk is transported back to the Enterprise, two versions of him appear, one good and one evil. This is the captain speaking. There's an imposter aboard the ship. The man who looks exactly like me and is pretending to be me. This man is dangerous. Utmost caution is to be observed. All crew members are to arm themselves. It raises the question about what we would be like if we removed all the allegedly bad things from our personality. We quickly learn that neither side can survive without the other, which is what makes us who we are. His negative side, which you call hostility, lust, violence, and his positive side, which Earth people express as compassion, love, tenderness. Perhaps even more profound is that this episode showcased the Vulcan nerve pinch for the first time. It's a great introduction to a long-standing plot device, combined with a fantastic story about what makes us who we are. He wants you to think that he's Captain Kirk. You know who I am. Number 19, The Devil in the Dark. When Star Trek stories are done right, they not only entertain, they also help elevate our view of the world. You think the creature is trying to push the colonists off the planet? It would seem so. Late in season one, we found ourselves in a mining colony that seemingly had an endless array of unexplainable problems. Kirk and Spock eventually discover the root cause, a new type of life form that has been attacking the mining crew and its equipment. The creature can exist for brief periods in such an atmosphere before returning to its own environment. I still think you're imagining things. You may be right, Doctor, but at least there's something to go on. We learn the creature has merely been trying to protect its young, which the miners had mistaken as a mere geological anomaly. The episode easily shows us how cooperation and understanding will always trump aggressive action. You should go for it. It seems logical, Captain. The Horda has a very logical mind. And after close association with humans, I find that curiously refreshing. Number 18, the ultimate computer. When the Enterprise is fitted with the new M5 computer, Kirk and crew are skeptical about how well a machine can do the job of a human. I'm getting a red alert right here. That thing is dangerous. At first, it seems perfectly fine, but much like all AI gone rogue stories, M5 malfunctions and ends up killing crew members both on and off the ship. Lexington, hit again. There's got to be a way of getting to the M5. There's got to be a way. There isn't. It's fully protected itself. As advanced as the technology is, even in this fictional future, it still takes the likes of a human, Captain Kirk this time, to convince the computer it's done wrong. This is a clear message about the implications of AI in all aspects of life, even if it aired 50 years ago. Compassion. That's the one thing no machine ever had. Number 17, Shore Leave. How would you fare in a world where anything you can think of can become real? The crew of the Enterprise discovers this firsthand when they land on a planet that is essentially a theme park for one's mind. Where did you get it, Mr. Sulu? I found it. I know it's a crazy coincidence, but I've always wanted one like this. Now, the crew doesn't learn this until the end. So much of what we watch is their imaginations literally gone wild. It's a lighthearted episode that shows a little bit of Kirk's early year insecurities and McCoy's fascination with medievalism. <laughs> Given how much heavy action the show focuses on, this is a nice breath of fresh air and a joy to see the crew in a more relaxed setting. With all due respects to the young lady, I've already had as much shore leave as I care for. Number 16, A Taste of Armageddon. Imagine a war without weapons, bloodshed, or even a single soldier ever stepping on foreign soil. Such was the case for Eminiar 7 and Bendikar. We have been at war for 500 years. You conceal it very well. These are two planets that have been fighting a virtual war via computer. A treaty between both worlds forces them to place casualties into a disintegration machine. Entrance, Captain. No exit. They go in, but they do not come out. A disintegration machine. So I would assume. What's fascinating about this episode is how two societies continue to fight each other even though there's no reason to continue. 
without being exposed to the atrocities of real war, neither side has a reason to end it. This is what Kirk ultimately does, forcing them to find a path to peace. It's a creative way to comment on the perils of real war. Peace or utter destruction. It's up to you. Number 15, This Side of Paradise. Hailing from a race that suppresses all emotion, some of Mr. Spock's best moments were when we did get to see him express some kind of feeling. I love you. I can love you. While on an away mission, Spock is exposed to spores, which allow him to experience a full range of emotions. He falls in love with a woman and finds himself with no desire to return to his Vulcan ways. Are you out of your mind? You were told to report to me at once. I didn't want to, Jim. It's one of the few times we get to see such a vulnerable version of Spock, even after the effects of the spores are gone. He's a man left knowing what true happiness feels like and having to let it go. It's a fantastic character story that gave us far more depth from Spock than we would expect. I am what I am, Layla. And if there are self-made purgatories, then we all have to live in them. Number 14, Day of the Dove. By using the Klingons as a proxy for the Russians during the Cold War, Star Trek was able to tell stories about such conflicts without coming across as too political or preachy. Stand and fight, you coward. Day of the Dove was a perfect example of how Gene Roddenberry's vision of the future was one of peace rather than aggression. An alien entity put Kirk's crew up against the Klingons for the sole purpose of feeding off their hate and anger towards each other. Senseless violence. Fighting while uh, an alien has total control over us. Yet in the end, even these two enemies found common ground and chose to walk away from the fight to save themselves. It's a story that shows how even enemies can be allies and is as true today as it was in the 1960s. We need no urging to hate humans. But for the present, only a fool fights in a burning house. Out! <laughs> Number 13, The Menagerie. The original pilot episode of Star Trek featured Christopher Pike as the captain of the Enterprise, with a very different version of Mr. Spock. If they survive the crash, we aren't going to go, to be certain. NBC didn't like the episode, so they ordered a second pilot. The footage from the original was then reused later in a two-part episode called The Menagerie. We've lost the captain. Do you read? It's one of the few episodes that gives the audience a window into a pre-Kirk Enterprise era at the time. Introducing Pike into the main Trek also allowed the character to be resurfaced years later in both Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Strange New Worlds. So in a way, we can thank this old pilot for much of our modern Trek franchises. Number 12, Where No Man Has Gone Before. Where the original pilot, The Cage, failed, where no man has gone before succeeded. Men cannot survive of a race of true espers is born. In time, you'll understand that. As a story about two crew members who gain godlike superpowers, it can easily be overlooked for far better episodes. This second attempt gave us a new Captain James T. Kirk and a slightly different but more recognizable Mr. Spock. All I know is logic. Even Scotty and Sulu made appearances here. It was a far less cerebral episode than the original pilot and featured far more action. Between the revamped episode and William Shatner's on-screen presence, we can thank this episode for satisfying the folks at NBC and giving birth to a legendary franchise. I felt for him too. I believe there's some hope for you after all, Mr. Spock. Number 11, The Corbomite Maneuver. Can you count the number of times a Star Trek episode has been based on a floating thing in space? Neither can we, but The Corbomite Maneuver was certainly one of the better ones. Fire main bases. The Enterprise encounters a floating cube in space and is threatened with destruction. From there, it becomes a bit of a cat and mouse game, with Kirk and crew testing the limits of this new alien. You now have seven minutes left. <laughs> Despite the looming threat, Kirk is still as confident as ever, especially when he tries his poker bluff to save the ship. We get a nice balance of action, character development, and even a good laugh or two in between. Has it occurred to you that there's a certain inefficiency in constantly questioning me on things you've already made up your mind about? It gives me emotional security. 
Number 10. The Naked Time When a virus infects the Enterprise, inhibitions are tossed out the nearest airlock. Under the hyper-drunk influence of the affliction, Nurse Chapel professes her love for Spock. I'm in love with you, Mr. Spock. Kirk for his ship, and Sulu for topless fencing. Fencing tones a muscle. Oh my. Meanwhile, the restoration of the ship's decaying orbit around Psi 2000 is complicated when control of the vessel is taken over by a surly Irishman, who is determined to entertain the crew with an impromptu variety show. The roses all have left your cheeks. Number 9. The Doomsday Machine What happened to your ship, Matt? A ship attacked that, that thing. While trying to aid the USS Constellation, the Enterprise comes face to face with the hellish maw of the Doomsday Machine. Looks very much like Commodore Decker's Planet Killer. And it is pursuing us. With Kirk and Scotty trapped aboard the damaged ship. Transporter is damaged, we're taking evasive action. Commodore Decker, the Constellation's captain and sole survivor, takes command of the Enterprise with the aim of destroying the weapon. In command here, Mr. Spock. Maintain your course, helmsman. Get us in closer. Although Kirk saves the day, the highlight here is guest star William Wyndham, who channels both Captain Ahab and Humphrey Bogart while delivering a multi-layered blend of authority, vengeance, and vulnerability. There was, but not anymore. Number 8. Arena I shall be merciful and quick. In one of the signature moments of the series, Captain Kirk goes up against a Gorn commander in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Realizing he can't win, he hatches a crafty plan, but accidentally shares it with his rival on an open comm channel. Amazingly, his plan is not successful, but Kirk makes up for the blunder with an act of genius by reinventing gunpowder and making a diamond shooting gun out of stuff that's just lying around. Number 7. Mirror Mirror Troublesome. After a transporter glitch, Kirk, Scotty, McCoy, and Uhura find themselves in a parallel pirate universe. Here, sleeves are optional, sports bras are standard issue, and everyone is just a bit evil. Oh, and Spock has a beard. In an episode that created the Beard of Evil meme, Kirk and company must hide their true nature and avoid assassination attempts from Chekhov and Sulu while trying to get back to their own reality. What is this, Mr. Sulu? Mr. Spock has orders to kill you, Captain. Number 6. Journey to Babel The Enterprise is en route to a diplomatic conference on Babel when the Tellarite delegate is killed. Suspicion falls on the Vulcan ambassador, Spock's ailing father Sarek. But that theory is proven wrong when Thelev attacks Kirk and is revealed as an imposter. Assumed by Spock to be a cosmetically altered Orion, the assassin would rather die than talk. The episode is notable for introducing the Andorians, Tellarites. How do you vote, Sarek of Vulcan? Why must you know, Tellarit? And the troubled relationship between Spock and his father. And you haven't come to see us in four years, either. The situation between my father and myself has not changed. Number 5. Amok Time Suffering the Effects of Ponfar. It is a deeply personal thing. Spock returns to Vulcan to get lucky with his long betrothed bride, T. Pring. There's no need to be uh, embarrassed about it, Mr. Spock. It happens to the birds and the bees. The birds and the bees are not Vulcans, Captain. However, the would-be Mrs. Spock instead challenges our favorite pointy-eared hobgoblin to a death match against Captain Kirk. I make my choice. This one. A pop culture goldmine, this is the episode that introduced the famous Vulcan salute Live long, Tipao, and prosper. Live long and prosper, Spock. Spock's catchphrase, Ensign Chekhov, and the signature fight music that has since become a parody staple. Number 4. The Trouble with Tribbles A 
undoubtedly the cuddliest installment of the original series, this episode is packed with humor, wheat, and bar fights. While on duty at K7, the Enterprise and the station are overrun by Tribbles. Displaying both a natural love for chicken sandwiches and a hatred of Klingons, the fast-breeding fluffballs become heroes when they expose Arn Darvin as the clean-shaven, suit-wearing Klingon saboteur responsible for poisoning the station's wheat. Thanks, Tribbles! They don't like you, Mr. Darvin. I wonder why. Number 3. Space Seed When the Enterprise team discovers the crew of an ancient Earth ship in suspended animation, it's exciting times for historians. There it is. But things go south quick when the group's leader, Khan Noonien Singh, is revived. What ensues is a mule-kicking and axe-handle-smashing fight between Kirk and the genetically engineered Khan and their respective stunt doubles for control of the ship. When the captain exiles Khan to SETI Alpha 5, the seeds for the film Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan are planted. Number 2. Balance of Terror When several Federation outposts are destroyed near the neutral zone, it sparks the return of a long silent foe, the Romulans. Something visual ahead, Captain. Although the Romulan warbird has a cloak, this episode establishes that a ship cannot fire its weapons while the device is in use. Laser one, fire. Laser one, fire. <laughs> When Kirk pursues the cloaked ship, it becomes a thrilling submarine hunt in space, as well as a battle of wits and dirty tricks between him and the unnamed Romulan commander, played by Mark Leonard. Captain, standing by to beam your survivors aboard our ship. Prepare to abandon your vessel. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. The City on the Edge of Forever You won't get me! An overly medicated Dr. McCoy jumps through a time portal to the 1930s, causing the Nazis to win World War II and erasing the Federation from history. Dr. McCoy! Bones, no! Need more? Kirk and Spock follow Bones. And now. And learn he saved the life of a pacifist who will help delay America's entry into the war. Despite falling for her, Kirk realizes Edith Keeler must die to restore time and watches in horror as she is killed by a truck. Did we miss a great episode of this original series? Set your phasers on stun and shoot us a comment down below. And you cooperate with us, and uh, maybe we'll cut you in for a piece of the action. A minuscule, a very small piece. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.